This episode is brought to you by Tegas. Over the years of our partnership with Tegas, they have evolved from a pure expert network into a full company intelligence platform. I've been so impressed by the platform that my firm, Positive Sum, recently made an investment in Tegas. We did so because we feel that Tegas will be the gold standard platform for investing research for decades to come. Tegas streamlines the investment research process so you can get up to speed and find answers to critical questions on companies faster and more efficiently. The Tegas platform surfaces the hard-to-get qualitative insights, gives instant access to critical public financial data through BAM SEC, and helps you set up customized expert calls. It's all done on a single modern SaaS platform that offers 360-degree insight into any public or private company. As a listener, you can take Tegas for a free test drive by visiting tegas.co slash Patrick. This is Business Breakdowns. Business Breakdowns is a series of conversations with investors and operators diving deep into a single business. For each business, we explore its history, its business model, its competitive advantages, and what makes it tick. We believe every business has lessons and secrets that investors and operators can learn from, and we are here to bring them to you. To find more episodes of Breakdowns, check out joincolossus.com. All opinions expressed by hosts and podcast guests are solely their own opinions. Hosts, podcast guests, their employers or affiliates may maintain positions in the securities discussed in this podcast. This podcast is for informational purposes only and should not be relied upon as a basis for investment decisions. Today, we're breaking down one of the most important apps in the world, WeChat. WeChat is the default operating system for life and business in China. Founded inside of Tencent in 2011, it is the original super app and its 1.3 billion monthly active users can order food, message friends, play games, pay bills, shop, and more on the service. To break down WeChat, I'm joined by Connie Chen. Connie is a general partner at Andreessen Horowitz and is well known across Silicon Valley for her deep knowledge of the Chinese consumer technology landscape. We discuss WeChat's legendary founder, how trust is integral to the app's success, and why we haven't seen super apps proliferate in the West. Please enjoy this breakdown of WeChat. So Connie, today is going to be an opportunity to explore in great detail the many lessons of one of the most important apps in the world, WeChat, its history, its impact, the ways that some of the ideas inside the technology could be applied here in the West. We're going to have a ton of fun exploring this. I think we have to start with the word super app. That's a word that you were probably using far before just about anybody else, but it's become a very common word. It's often cited as a board level strategy for a DoorDash or some of these bigger Western apps, like let's become a super app, maybe Twitter now with Elon Musk. But there was one original in China that you're a deep expert in. Maybe just begin by giving us the broad brushstrokes of what that term super app means to you and why it is so powerful. Super app to me means that you are leveraging all your existing traffic and your existing distribution, and you are helping that customer find other products or services that they weren't naturally coming to you for in the first place. So for example, if you are a chat app like WeChat, they can now be used as a way to find food or to find taxi or to interact with X, Y, and Z store down the street. These are all services and products that are introduced to users inside WeChat. And importantly, they're not necessarily built by WeChat. It's basically they've opened themselves up. WeChat has opened itself up as a platform to work with these third-party developers, where third-party developers can create official accounts or mini programs and leverage the traffic that WeChat already has. And when I think about Western apps that are trying to take the same concept and this insight on business model... There's a couple use cases already in the West that we're starting to see emerge, ones that you alluded to, for example. And it's this idea that you might know so much about your customer, or maybe your customer is using your app so frequently that even though they're coming to you to order food, maybe you can direct them to also use that same app to order medicine, to order groceries, to order makeup, to order basic toiletries, you name it. Or maybe if you're using the Uber app already to hail a ride, Because you're using it so frequently, you might also think about using it to order your lunch. So this idea of using your existing traffic and distribution and doing lead gen with these third-party partners. You talk about the philosophical difference between, I would say, the West's emphasis on performing individual functions for a user through software versus WeChat's emphasis on what I'll call owning the user in its entirety. 
what is important to understand about those two different styles? Because that seems to kind of sum up how East versus West has been different at the app level. When I think about the East versus West framework, I think in the West, we often think of horizontal expansion, meaning we have one feature, it's taking off, let's go expand to other countries. And you've seen lots of Western companies do this. They will find something that hits in the US and then they're going off to all these other Western worlds and they're trying to focus on growing their number of users. For a bunch of reasons in Asia, oftentimes they're taking a vertical approach versus a horizontal approach. And the idea is you get the users in Asia, in China to use your app. But rather than say, okay, now I'm going to go get all the US users to use it. Now I'm going to go get all these users in the UK and France and Germany and what have you. They think about what more can I do to serve that user? What more do I know about that user that helps me think about how can I solve their issues around work or ordering breakfast or getting their kid to school versus just the one feature that I'm already servicing them on? So it's this vertical approach, thinking about the user focusing not on number of users, but more importantly, how many times a day are you relying on this app? How frequently are you opening this app every day? How core is it to your daily habits? This is a huge business and it's not a secret anymore and hasn't been a secret for a long time how powerful it is. And there's definitely people that think that this should exist in the West or even have tried to make it exist, but yet it doesn't. Why do you think that is? I understand the vertical versus horizontal focus of building strategy, but what are the various reasons do you think why we don't have some clean analog in the West of WeChat? I think to answer this question, I have to take you back to the history of WeChat. So WeChat started in 2011. And in 2011, China's digital penetration looked really different than digital penetration in the US. I mean, back then, it's hard to believe this, but the majority of people in China didn't use email regularly, didn't even have an email address. So email didn't have the same kind of penetration that it did here in the US in that time frame. And at the same time, even though people did have text messages, there was tons of texting spam that was happening in China. When WeChat came onto the scene, messaging wasn't a fragmented problem. Messaging was a very much needed product when people started using their smartphones. In that sense, it was able to very quickly become the dominant communication platform in China. To this day, most of my friends in Asia, I don't have their phone numbers. I don't have their email addresses. Some of them don't even have email addresses or they check it like once a month. It's basically because everything runs on WeChat. That is my only way of communicating with these people. It's just so different than in the US, even 10 years ago, but even more true today, messaging and communication is so fragmented. Every morning when I wake up, I have to look at Signal. I have to look at my Instagram DMs. I have to look at Twitter DMs, LinkedIn messages, my like email, my apps. Slack, <laughs> my iMessage. It's just, it's such a mess. You say 10 Fs and that's not even like an understatement here. That's reality for all of us. And because there is this no unifying platform for communication here, it's very difficult for messaging to be that same wedge that can spawn a new super app here in the US. It's interesting that it seems if you compare the things you can do in WeChat, all the functions with the functions that you can perform in iOS, let's say on an iPhone, it's almost like the operating system here in the West is down at the hardware level with Apple. And in China, it's at the software level with WeChat. Anything that you would react to there? It seems as though maybe that's the answer, that basically iOS is our WeChat, that all those functions are just in little different buttons and apps. And this will bring us to the notion of identity and why that's so powerful and controlling an ID, a user ID in just a moment. But any reaction to that difference or that gap? Yeah. I also think of WeChat as an operating system or like a browser to the internet. It is the one app you really cannot live without in China. And also conversely, if I only have that one app, I can fully function in China as well. And I think the way that ID is managed and controlled both for the benefit of the user and the benefit of the developer, is really interesting. It's very different. I've got a different login for every one of those damn apps on my iOS and my iPhone. Very different in WeChat. So maybe describe the system of user identity itself and why a unifying ID allows for some of this interesting architecture. The unification of everything happening in WeChat, because WeChat is designed in many ways to still keep a clean interface, actually gives the consumer a lot of control and privacy. And I know that sounds so counterintuitive, 
when you think about West versus East apps, but hear me out. On WeChat, when I am subscribing to one of these official accounts, like the service account, say I'm subscribing to McDonald's service account, they can only push me messages four times a month. There's a limit. And if they use that all up the first week, it cannot push me any more messages that entire month. And just contrast that with any e-commerce site you've ever given your email address to and how many emails you get from them every day. It's to the point where I almost never look at my promotions tab on my Gmail because it's a mess. Some of these brands, they literally email you every day or every other day. And there's a lot more controls and these guardrails that are put in place when these businesses are interacting with the end user. In addition to that, if I give my email address to a Western website, I know that email address gets sold to someone else. Or I know my cell phone number gets sold to someone else. And that's why we have all these spam issues in our email and our text. And increasingly, that's why email marketing is less and less efficient. In Asia, when I'm working on WeChat, if I am interacting with an official account, say I get too many messages. And again, it's still capped for these service accounts at four per month. And if it's a subscription account, it's like separately folded, just like promotions are separately folded in your Gmail. If I ever feel like I don't like this content anymore, I just swipe and I'm unsubscribed. And that company doesn't have my phone number. That company doesn't have my email address and they can't find me. They cannot contact me. So very strangely, my inbox is so much cleaner on my WeChat than it is on my email by leaps and bounds because I have full control over what kind of content I want to see. And that's some of the insight around how they design their identity. Another one I'll point out is the ability to use WeChat for interest group conversations. So group chats are very powerful on WeChat. Not only are you using WeChat to communicate with people you already know, like your friends, your family, your coworkers, people you know in real life, like everyone you would normally chat with on iMessage. You're also very often in interest-based groups. Maybe you're in a group of other like-minded people, other people who are hosting great podcasts, other people who love technology, you name it. And the reason why these interest-based groups thrive is again, because of this control around identity. When I join one of these groups, those users don't necessarily know my real name and those users don't have my contact information. It's very different than if I used WhatsApp, for example, to join a large group. They have my phone number. And that to me is actually very intrusive. I don't like joining a lot of these groups unless it's with people I trust or people where I know it's been curated. I don't want my phone number floating out there. The way that the identity is designed in WeChat allows for more private direct communication, but also group communication with these interest-based groups. And most importantly, lots of communication and interaction with companies and businesses because that user feels so in control. You've given us a great overview of why there was the wedge. In 2011, the communication needs were very different in China versus the US. And we'll come back in a minute just to the developer focus and how developers can build on top of WeChat that's made the ecosystem so powerful. But just a level set before we do that, let me just describe the business in its basic sense, maybe compared to like a WhatsApp or something like that, which I think notoriously has had a hard time. It's an amazing tool that we all use every day, but it's not really much of a business even though it was very expensive for Facebook to buy. What does WeChat's business look like? How many users are there? How much revenue per user? How does that revenue break down by the various use cases that you've outlined? Just like a auditory pie chart of the business itself would be great at this stage. So like you said, WeChat is not a secret. This company has a ton of users. Earlier this year, Q1 of 2022, 1.3 billion monthly active users. I think there's only maybe five or so apps that have crossed the 1 billion monthly active user mark. So very few single digits for sure. So very widely used and pretty much ubiquitously used across China. And I'd say in terms of revenue, it's also generating real revenue. In 2021, they generated over $17 billion of revenue that equates to around 20% of Tencent, which is the parent company's revenue. Revenue is generated in multiple ways. There is advertising. There is WeChat Pay, which is their equivalent of PayPal the thing that you would use to pay for things when you're interacting with businesses inside of the app. They also have many programs where there are different ways to charge. But I think the important thing when I think about the business model of WeChat is that 
it's not like 100% advertising based, which is often the thing that we always default to here in the West. And I don't know, 10, 15 years ago, and still today, advertising is a very, very powerful business model. But the problem is twofold. One, it definitely degrades the user experience and it definitely degrades user trust into the brand, which limits the brand's potential to expand to other revenue streams. And two, at this point, unless you are already a company that has a ton of users, it's very difficult to rely on advertising as a business model because these advertising engines are actually quite difficult to build as well. So new startups that are building companies today, they can't be ad-based. There's just not enough revenue. When I think about WeChat and how they think about their diversification of revenue, the fact that they don't rely on advertising is very key. Now the number may have gone up, but I would say maybe three, four years ago, they used to limit the number of ads a user would see to say two ads a day. I know it's higher now, but it's still not high. And think about people are in this app for hours a day, hours. I would challenge you to go use Instagram for 10 minutes and tell me how many ads you see in your newsfeed for one minute, 30 seconds. Tell me how many, <laughs> how many ads you see in your newsfeed. And then just imagine if you saw two per day, the consumption, the content, the way you feel about the brand, night and day different, completely, completely different. So the fact that WeChat doesn't rely just on advertising, I think is really key. And that has actually allowed them to build trust in the brand that they could launch a very successful payment platform. And WeChat Pay is very core to their business. It's used when you are interacting with different companies to pay for things, but it's even used in the offline world outside of WeChat. So I can go to a Starbucks, I can go to a restaurant and I can pay with WeChat Pay. What parts of using the app today in China do you think feel the most futuristic? Where if I were to download the app, which I don't have, I've looked at it just in preparation for today, but let's say I hadn't and I went into it, started using it for five days or something continuously. What do you think would most surprise the average American about using WeChat today? I think the biggest surprise is how it truly is this all-in-one app. If you find the right mini programs to download or the right official accounts, you have no need to even open a browser app on your phone. It's that crazy. There are so many services and websites and sources of content that live inside of WeChat. I mean, imagine going one day without opening your browser app. That's a crazy thought for someone in the West. Because there are way too many websites that don't have presence on Twitter or Instagram or any of these other social media giants that we use here in the West. But in Asia, it all goes back to that super app framework, that ability for these large developers or small developers to create different services to plug into WeChat users. Maybe give an example. So we've got this common base of singular identification, a singular payment rail that people have opted into. Just those two things alone, me as a person and ability for me to send money around are like key, key primitives, like you said, that are super fragmented here in the US. There's a million banks and payment companies and ID companies and connection services and blah, blah, blah. There's this incredible amount of business and they've got this simplified version. Maybe Pingdoduo or something is a good example of a very large company in this case that was built on top of WeChat originally. That may be too big of an example, but a massive, massive business. Just talk a little bit about the way developers have built. The payment rails. I love that you brought that up, Patrick, because it's so core to why WeChat's able to build this beautiful transaction system on top of it. And to give a sense of the transactions, I'm talking hundreds of billions of dollars of transactions happen inside of WeChat every year. This is substantial transaction volume. Again, I have to take you back into history. So in 2014, this is when WeChat first put out the framework for what is WeChat Pay today. They launched this feature. It started out as this fun entertainment feature called Red Packets. So I don't know if you've ever been to like a Chinese New Year celebration or like a Chinese wedding. I have. So then you've seen people hand out these things that look like red envelopes, right, Patrick? Yep. And they're filled with cash. They're usually given to little children. And this is their equivalent of maybe like a Christmas gift or like a Christmas card. This is a blessing that you are passing on to someone as a monetary gift. And these monetary gifts are completely socially acceptable in China and in broader Asia as well. So WeChat launched this feature called Red Packets, where because you're already communicating with all your friends inside of WeChat, 
you can now gift digital red packets to each other. But they did it in a really fun way. Not just like a Venmo transaction, which is probably how it would get implemented if a Western company tried it. They gamified it instead. So they allowed you to give away these red packets to different groups. And some of the gamification of it could be, so for example, I might be in a group of 20 people. I might send out one red packet of say $20 and say, I want five people to get it random amounts. A message goes out to that group of 20 people. Whoever claims it first fastest, the first five people to claim it, get it. And then random amounts get opened up. And then you can see how much everyone else got. And it becomes this fun game. And actually, sometimes the person who gives it claims it as well because they can get the lion's share back of the money they spent. (laughs) It started being used in such a fun give-get way where you would throw one out to the group. If someone receives some money, they throw one back out to the group. It was just a very fun, very festive thing that happened. And in order to send the red packets, and also more importantly, when you receive a balance in order to use it, you would set up a payment account with WeChat. You would basically link your banking information, your bank card information. And this is really key because the way that it went viral with these kind of group packets allowed it to penetrate as a user behavior so much faster. If I was just sending one-to-one, then when I send out money, that recipient, yes, they have to link their bank card in order to use it in order to extract the money. But because I have these group chats that were flourishing, I could send it out to 20 people, to 50 people. And even if you only got pennies each time, they would add up and you might still link your bank card in order to take that money back out. But what happened was basically because your bank card is now linked, your payments are now linked. People can keep a balance inside of WeChat. And when you have a balance sitting there, then you start thinking, oh, where else can I use it? And wow, I can just click this one button and I can hail the equivalent of an Uber or Lyft and I can just use my balance and pay it off with that. And it started this whole flywheel of people now thinking about WeChat as not just a place to communicate, but also a place to be able to transact. And this idea of having a balance of money inside your WeChat is also something, I mean, Alipay really helped push that to the forefront too. I think that's quite different than the way people are using Venmo and PayPal here in the US. People aren't thinking of keeping balances in there. It's not integrated, right? It's a separate singular function of sending money for something versus it being integrated in the app itself. Right, exactly. And because it's integrated right there, Imagine now all these things can be one tap transactions. Imagine if Instagram, and actually, thank goodness they don't have this yet because I would spend way too much money. They're trying to get people to save their payment credentials. But imagine if every user had their payment credentials tied, how much more effective those ads would be. That's the payment rails that existed in WeChat since 2014. And ever since then, the businesses have been flourishing. That leads directly to this mini program concept that Pingdodo, I mentioned earlier, is one of these examples, but really the ability to build full functionality apps inside of the WeChat ecosystem. So how do they do this? What was their strategy for rolling out the ability for other external companies and developers to build these mini programs? It sounds, again, like iOS. There's a developer toolkit and there's a standard and there's an economic relationship that's standardized and so on. How did that story unfold? And we haven't talked about Alan Jang yet, the product visionary behind a lot of this. So maybe now's the time to invoke his name a little bit too. Tell the story of many programs and start to talk about Alan Jang and his role. Many programs, like you said, it's basically an app inside WeChat that's near fully functional. I think the thing that laid the framework and the rails for that is official accounts. So official accounts started much earlier than many programs. This started in 2012, basically one year after WeChat was launched, a year and a couple months. And that was when businesses started having kind of this one-to-many relationship with WeChat. Businesses could create accounts. And then many programs is taking that to the next level, allowing businesses to have full feature functionality, not just being limited to this chat or video or voice communication, which was what a lot of the official accounts were having to rely on. And many programs has now flourished very much so today, where To your point, I can just add a mini program or I can access these mini programs without having to go to an app store, download a separate app, create a separate login, 
Now everything can live inside the many programs inside of WeChat. And the helpful thing is then when everything's integrated into one place, you can pull these things in to your daily workflow in a more unique way. Just to give you a sense of transaction volume, I mean, many programs in 2021, their transaction volume was over $400 billion. Wow. It's like very substantial money and transactions and basically like the stuff that you would be doing on websites or other apps, you're just doing it on the mini program instead. You're taking away the user friction. You're allowing the user to have to click fewer buttons to tap fewer things to get the same thing accomplished. And now it's to the point where it's so popular in Asia to use these mini programs that developers, honestly, they're going to create a mini program more likely before they create their full-fledged app that would sit inside an app store. It's fast to create. It works on iOS. It works on Android as well. It's easy to plug into the WeChat system. Do we know what the margin structure of WeChat looks like? Like I know we have Tencent. We can sort of infer based on its size, some rough numbers, but... As you think about this business model itself, it seems like it could be a fairly high margin business that is run on software after all. How do you think about the appeal of its business, the challenges to the business model, and the implications there? I don't know their latest headcounts. I don't know the actual specifics, but I would say that I do think WeChat benefited a lot from the fact that it had Tencent that had other sources of revenue and was not 100% reliant on WeChat to be profit generating on day one. Because WeChat for a very, very long time wasn't making money. The fact that it lives inside of Tencent and Tencent was so forward thinking to realize that chat and messaging was an important thing to own and build, I think really gave WeChat a lot more room to breathe. And you mentioned Alan Zong earlier, and he's the creator of WeChat. And I think the important thing is that Tencent allows Alan Zong to protect the customer experience. There is no pressure to bombard users with ads. There is no pressure to hit a revenue target by throwing pop-up ad or another type of ad format that's quite disruptive. That's very actually very popular in China. These pop-up ads are very popular in China apps. And Alan Zong was able to make all of these product calls that actually in the short term are bad for revenue, (laughs) but in the long term are better for retention and for protection of the brand trust. I'll give you an example. When official accounts first launched back in 2012, and you were signing up to subscribe to an influencer or to subscribe to Hagen dazs or, or Starbucks or what have you, before there was no, some of these guardrails were not in place, like the four articles per month, that kind of stuff wasn't all in place. And you would get bombarded with a lot of content in the same way that we're bombarded with all this unnecessary email content every day. Alan Zong very early on created a folder that says subscriptions and everything gets foldered off if you are basically a subscription account, which basically is the same thing like Gmail saying, I'm going to create a promotions tab. I'm going to automatically put everything in the promotions tab. You have to proactively tap into it to go look at that content. Doesn't show up in your inbox. And if Gmail didn't do that, can you imagine how painful it would be to use Gmail every day? Completely unusable. But at the same time, that takes long-term thinking because those are the same people who would be trying to buy ads or trying to push more usage and by sectioning it off. So counterintuitive in some ways. But Gmail can afford to do that because it's inside Google. And in the same way, I think WeChat can afford to do that because it was inside Tencent. If Alan was teaching a class on product at some great university or something, what do you think he would be talking about? What makes him a genius? What is he so good at? He has these basic frameworks that he always will go back to and these North Stars. So for example, treat your user like a friend is one of his North Stars. And I mentioned a lot of Chinese apps usually have this very disruptive pop-up app. The moment you open the app, actually, there's usually a pop-up app. A lot of apps have this. He refuses to do that for WeChat. His thinking is if you see a friend, and they throw out something promotional or throw out something transactional before you even say hello, (laughs) then you're not going to want to engage. It's not how you would treat a friend. And instead, WeChat should be a place where there is trust. So therefore, I'm not going to throw up this pop-up ad ever on WeChat. Another really subtle example, even something like a read receipt 
on a lot of these Western messaging apps, I can see if you have read my message and it might cause me anxiety. Like, why did you not reply? You have read it. By design, WeChat doesn't have that. And it's again, he doesn't want people sending the message and then just sitting there figuring out when will this person reply or going back to read it. It is kind of a send the message and go and close the app. Very strangely, the idea is not just to keep this user in this app for as long of a session as possible. Instead, it's actually get the user to the information or the thing that they want to do as fast as possible so that they can get in and get out. But because you build that trust with the user, they are in and out hundreds of times a day (laughs) versus in and then you spend way too much time and then you're like, oh, what was I doing? It seems as though there's a lot of saturation in most senses of the word. Huge percent of the population uses the app. Sounds like basically any business that's launching it, something that they would engage with their customer does it on WeChat first. There's huge businesses that rely on it, Metuan and Pinduoduo, et cetera. How saturated do you think this is? Is most of this story behind us for WeChat? And the future is much more about this is just a business and it'll grow with the economy. And a lot of the opportunity is sort of mind, if you will. How do you think about its past versus its future and the saturation point that it's reached with its customers? I don't think it's saturated at all. I mean, WeChat usage penetration in China is like it's already penetrated. In terms of how people are going to continue to rely on this and the new businesses that can be built on top of it, I don't think that's saturated. And I think it's because, again, like what are these core principles that Ellen Zong subscribes to? Decentralized ecosystem is definitely one. User is your friend. Technology is meant to make you more efficient. KPIs are not everything. And then decentralized ecosystem. These are the principles that he regularly touts. And to your point, Pinduoduo is built on top of WeChat. And there's other apps and these other massive companies I think will continue to be built on top of WeChat. What lessons can be learned about self-disruption? We haven't mentioned QQ yet, which preceded as a messaging app, WeChat. And I think early days, you might have said, well, geez, we're cannibalizing our own company. What have you learned about building competition yourself (laughs) or something like that in the story of WeChat? I will take that one level further because the way they disrupted themselves was so fascinating and so admirable in some ways. So QQ Messenger was widespreadly used in a big way already in China before WeChat was even built. And think of this as a messaging app you would use on your computer. So maybe for us, it was Instant Messenger, Yahoo Instant Messenger, AOL Instant Messenger, ICQ, whatever. It was a great messaging app on the computer. But the insight for WeChat was when smartphones arrived, maybe there should be a new experience. And rather than just taking the thing that worked on the computer and squeezing it into a smaller phone, maybe we should rethink what WeChat can look like. The mandate inside Tencent was let's create something that would be messaging first, but made specifically for the smartphone without any of the old chains of needing to be backwards compatible with the QQ experience. But the reason why I say I'm going to take it a little further is, fun story, Tencent actually had two teams build it to see which one would build a better one. And that is also a management philosophy that happens inside a lot of Chinese companies, which I think is really powerful. Not popular here in the West, but works really, really well. In Asia, they had these two teams building it and Alan Zong's team built WeChat and it took off. But the key is they were not saddled with the requirements of backward compatibility or using the same design frameworks as QQ. And I think that's so important because I think one major hindrance to innovation in the West is that we are not a mobile first society yet. We are not a mobile only society by no means. We are still largely doing large transactions on our computer. I've talked to a travel company once which shared a story, which is that people might search for flights on their phone, but they're going to go to their computer to purchase the ticket. And I'm guilty of doing that myself, even. These big transactions, I'm going to my computer. I don't know why. I feel like I trust it more, even though it's the same thing. It's the same website. So psychologically, we're not there. And as a result, it's difficult for developers because oftentimes they have to create something that works on the web, that also works on the mobile, has to be backwards compatible, has to has the same features, same functionality. And many companies have a difficult time 
creating a mobile experience that has features that the website doesn't have, that shows in the way that these teams are organized, and it causes a slowdown in innovation. Because if you think about the smartphone, and this is another way that I sometimes talk about super apps and mobile first, if you think about the smartphone, there's a bunch of features and functionality that your computer just doesn't have. Easy access to your microphone, a compass, the location, front and back camera. And in the West, we will have companies that build a great mobile experience, but no web experience or like a great web experience and okay mobile experience. But because they have to build for both, it's more taxing. It's more distracting. You can't just own the users and grow very quickly because again, our mind is fragmented on computer usage and functionality versus mobile functionality. The way that Tencent disrupted itself is very interesting because they were able to say, okay, yes, QQ was great for the computer, but maybe smartphone needs something brand new. Again, because they weren't saddled with needing to have the same exact look and feel, the same features, the same functions, they were able to design something that was very different. And I think this idea of mobile first design and mobile first thinking is very hard for a lot of the large Western companies who are very big on PC on laptops to adopt, to be able to think, how can I translate or throw out my design framework or throw out my business model and be forced to think of something brand new when I want to dominate mobile? I'll just give you a very simple example. Ads on the phone are so much more intrusive than on the computer. When I'm reading an article on the computer, my mind can kind of just zone out on the right rail, right? I'm just like ignoring it, not looking at it. On the phone, it's the whole width of the screen. It is so much more painful and yucky to look at and harder to know how much I have to scroll to get rid of the ad. And so it's just, it's more annoying. And so if you're truly mobile first, you are forced very early on to think of a business model that's not ads. And you're forced to think about things like paid memberships, which I recently wrote about, or live video or tipping or what have you, because mobile ads are just not that great in their current form. And I think this shift towards, okay, new smartphone platform has arrived. How should we build for that? Is something that the US still has to grapple with because we are not a mobile first, mobile only society yet. One of my favorite ideas from the author of a book called The Systems Bible is that there's no such thing as designing an effective complex system. Any system that's now complex and works started as a simple system and sort of evolved naturally. Do you think that that's the right way to describe the product? You've already described how monetization has been patient and subtle and sort of like aligned with the user. I don't know how else to put it. It sounds like the growth of the product has also followed that same pattern of tasteful from the user's perspective. Maybe that's Alan's leadership. If monetization was patient and subtle and nuanced, is it basically the same for how the product itself has grown? I think so. I think the feature set has also grown in a very patient way. It's actually to the point where that's why it's so hard. Even if you've downloaded WeChat, if you're not friends with anyone on WeChat, it's like an empty app. There's nothing to look at really, right? Or very, very little. And it's because it is so protective of the user. And I do think it has been very patient in even rolling out features. So for example, now in the same way that you have like a TikTok video feed, you also have that equivalent in WeChat, but it took a long time for them to add that feature in. If you think about now all of this that we've discussed, all the lessons, the unique story of WeChat, the unique business model, et cetera, and you've got your Western investor hat on, which is one I know you wear a lot. What does it most cause you to do, do you think, that whether that's look for in companies or advise companies when you're on the board or whatever actions or decisions you make? because of all you know about this company and this ecosystem that someone that wouldn't know this company maybe might not do. How is it influencing you in your thinking about growing businesses in the West and also investing in them in the West? As you alluded to, part of my business model as a venture capitalist is I'm looking for ideas that I can then port over to the US. And that's a big reason why I study and spend so much time understanding and learning about these Chinese products. And there are many learnings from WeChat, I think, that can be ported over. One, obviously, super app, the idea that when you are at scale, there are different business models besides just mobile ads. So the creativity around business models is something I get really excited about. And the super app is a very elegant business model. The idea of how you can incorporate payments into something that's entertainment or content oriented. 
or communication oriented as something that's not necessarily intuitive in the West yet. But I think WeChat has proven that it can work. And in that sense, when you think about TikTok or Instagram, right now it's still these content and communication platforms and entertainment platforms, but can it one day become commerce oriented, transaction oriented and what that transition might look like? I also think a lot about identity and user trust. Again, the way that WeChat has been so thoughtful and patient in rolling out its features and the way that it has protected users from having to release their contact information to businesses or to other strangers and how that focus on the user experience has actually been so core to its ability to become this operating system, this ecosystem. In the same way that you trust Apple because they're the OS, a lot of people can put that kind of trust when they're using WeChat into WeChat because they don't feel like WeChat is trying to spam them with ads. They don't feel like WeChat is trying to extract every dollar from them in many ways. So I think protecting that user trust is so key. And then the last thing, which we haven't touched upon today, is also this ability for consumer products to also venture into enterprise territory. WeChat is used for personal communication, but it is also used for work communication. So rather than needing to use work email, work Slack, Google Docs, Google Slides, all of those things can happen inside of WeChat. And it's actually possible, in the East at least, for one app to be able to go past consumers and venture into the enterprise world. And that's something I haven't seen in the US yet. And still TBD, whether socially we will accept something like that, or if we really want that kind of separation of work and personal life. But WeChat is also a great example of that phenomenon, which is super powerful. What companies in the West do you watch most carefully as it relates to all of these ideas? Like, who do you think has a chance to best deploy some of these learnings? By the way, this could be like a brand new startup if you want it to be, or it could be one of the big platforms. With your unique lens, where are you looking and watching carefully? Well, I think a lot of big companies have already shown signs of taking on this approach. As you mentioned, some of them have publicly said that they want to be super apps. Most recently, Microsoft even mentioned this concept of venturing into super app framework. But also from like a day-to-day user perspective, when I look at DoorDash, I use it mostly for food, but now I can put in my Sephora membership number and order makeup and get it delivered that day. But the idea of linking it to my membership account is the super app part. It's not just that I'm allowing you to order from this other store. I am linking my membership and all reasons why I would separately go to Sephora.com into my DoorDash account. So I no longer really am losing any features or functionality if I'm separately opening a browser. I think that's a great example of super app thinking. Even Uber putting Uber Eats back into the main app is another example of that. Realizing why am I paying for twice the CAC when I can instead put it in one app. And ultimately, super apps work because it is a better user experience. It is a better user experience for the user to not have to go open a separate app and go through that friction again of searching for something if you can predict what they need right there and then. Western companies I'm watching, ByteDance, definitely one of them with TikTok. TikTok right now being very entertainment driven, but if you look at what TikTok looks like in China, this is their app doing. That one is very much already a huge commerce transaction platform, very popular with short form video that converts to transactions, whether it's a products or services or tickets or entertainment, lots of shopping is happening on Doing already in China. What companies in the West do you think most treat their users like a friend? I love that idea, if any. Treating users like a friend. Well, I think this goes back to user trust. How does the user feel after you've interacted with them? Does the user feel like this product is empathizing with them? You know, some brands that I think people feel that trust with is probably Apple. If you survey Gen Z and you ask them what brands do they love and trust, Apple usually ranks pretty highly on that list. So I'd say they're definitely one. How about the relationship between a platform? And I'm so interested by how this became a platform. It didn't start as a platform. It's very hard to start as a platform, but it seems like the place that everyone wants to end up become a place that others build upon because that's just such a powerful business concept. But then the relationship between platform and the suppliers, the app builders, others building on top of the platform, 
becomes really important. I would say lots of people think Apple's a good friend as a consumer, but if you ask a lot of app developers, you can see it very famously all over Twitter, they do not think of Apple as a friend. They think of them as someone taking too hefty a toll on something that they've built with a 30% rake on in-app purchases. How has that side of the WeChat story unfolded? How does WeChat treat its suppliers? Are they friends? <laughs> Are they partners? Are they something different? Definitely friends and partners. There is no 30% take rate off of these transactions that are happening inside of WeChat. There might be a payment take rate, but it's the same as if you were using PayPal or that kind of equivalent service. So I think in many ways, developers feel like it is more of a level playing field and that they're not being extracted where a lot of developers in the US, they feel frustrated because they think that they're providing the majority of the value when they create the app. 30% does seem like a lot to a lot of Western developers. But in Asia, again, with WeChat, there's no 30% take rate. I'd say another thing, very subtle nuance, is that in the US, when you look at the app store, there's app rankings and there's recommendations to users on which apps you should download. And there's good and bad to that. And there's also reasons why developers feel frustrated when they're not ranking or when they're not recommended. In WeChat, there is no app ranking equivalent. When you open your app, There's no recommended push of these are the official accounts you should follow. There's no push of these are the interest groups you should join. It really levels the playing field such that if you find this service account or this official account or this mini program, it's because someone else recommended it to you or because you sought it out on your own. And in many ways, that pushes the burden of proving value to the developer. And strangely, it gives smaller developers more of a chance to grow because there isn't this the big get bigger idea. As a big company has to do the same amount of work to get a user to find their official account and add it to their WeChat as a small developer. And that's like a very, again, small, subtle feature credited back to Alan Zong, but with the thought that I don't just want big developers getting bigger. How do you think about the regulatory environment behind all of this? Very famously, China has been tougher on a lot of the big internet companies in the last two or three years. That obviously impacts the playing field. It's interesting that you've described WeChat itself and the playing field it's created as this very level, very free sounding thing. How do you think about the click up from that in terms of constraints on what it can do, its potential growth? given that it's operating in China? I'd say that's an area I probably am less inclined to have great predictions on. There's just uncertainty there, but it applies to every tech company that's operating there. If we think about all of this and how it's influenced your investing, let's say I went around to all your general partners at Andreessen that know you best and said, describe for me what a Connie Chan investment is. What attributes do you think that they would list that you're consistently looking for? I'm always looking for really elegant business models. I am looking for people who are building for the long term. I am looking for TAMs that have yet to be discovered or are not obvious yet, or new user behaviors that are not obvious yet. Oftentimes, the reason why I look to Asia, and this is my secret, which I regularly share, is that I think in so many ways, because Asia is mobile first, mobile only, and because there's so much innovation that's happening there, I get ideas from looking at things that are working in Asia. It doesn't result in 100% of the deals that I do, but a lot of them, I'm getting inspiration from ideas. And then I can find a Western equivalent or a Western team that wants to learn and take advantage of those learnings. What does the word elegant in elegant business model mean to you? Elegant to me means self-sustaining, that it is a profitable business that it doesn't have to hit crazy home run in terms of user penetration and retention to ever become profitable. An elegant business model means one that can grow organically as well. Ones that people love the product, they talk about it. But business model also can include things like revenue diversification, the ability to make money outside of ads, um, whether it's creating enough value for you to justify subscriptions or membership content, or maybe you have another way that you can still become a profitable business besides just using ads. One of the ways that we like to close these conversations is to think about holistically 
one big lesson for operators and one big lesson for investors after having studied a single company. So if you think about WeChat and you had to distill it down to just one lesson for each of those archetypes, for the investor and for the operator, what do you think WeChat has most taught those two people? I'd say for operators, my main learning on studying WeChat now for literally 10 years and seeing many Western companies try it is that I see that it doesn't generally work unless it is top-down, understood and embraced by a company. And it's because it changes the way you structure your teams. It changes the way that you would prioritize features. It changes short-term revenue. So a lot of times for a company to really pull it off, it has to come from the top or the top has to be bought into it. I'll give you an example. If I am taking my app to lead gen for something else, I'm using a space that normally would have gone to an ad. Instead, I'm placing a button for something else. I will take a short-term revenue hit. And that is very difficult for so many Western companies to adopt because they are managing that PL for that newsfeed. So again, it has to come from the top for someone to say, yes, I know this model, my current revenue stream is going great, but I want to diversify for the long term. I want to build a different kind of ecosystem. I want to work with more partners. I will take that potential short-term revenue hit in order to do something like that. So that's a big thing for operators. Many companies, I see people, sometimes junior people who get it. They have the same vision, but it's very hard for them to influence the product because it, again, changes how you would design your teams and it changes how you would prioritize features. For investors, I think we're still at the earliest innings of super apps. I love the fact that more companies are embracing it from the top down and saying, hey, I have this great distribution. I already know so much about my users or I have so many users already. What else can I do for them? How else can I serve them? And the fact that more founders and executives are coming around to this kind of framework, I think is exciting because I still think it's a very powerful thing that's not not China specific, but it's really a universal framework we can adopt. Connie, this has been so much fun and so interesting. I remember reading some of your early articles about this, I don't know, seven years ago or something. It's been a while. And it's one of those products that I just think has so much to teach. So I'm thankful for your time today and for sharing all the lessons you've learned from WeChat. Thanks a lot. It's been great. To find more episodes of Breakdowns ranging from Costco to Visa to Moderna, or to sign up for our weekly summary, check out joincolossus.com. That's J-O-I-N-C-O-L-O-S-S-U-S dot com. 